Good morning, Broad Street family. We're so glad to be back worshiping with you today in church and Sunday school. We hope you are enjoying your Sunday morning and having a very special Lenten season. Today, AJ wants to share his favorite verse with you. First, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John three sixteen. We hope you remember that as you go through your week this week. Have a wonderful day. Well, good morning and welcome to Broad Street United Methodist Church. My name is Betsy Schweitzer. I'm one of the pastors here at Broad Street, and we're just so blessed that you're with us this morning. Now, don't change the channel. Don't turn the dial. Uh, you are in the right place. This is contemporary worship, but we're doing some new things in our contemporary venue in Triplet Hall, for those of you that are familiar with it. We're doing some renovation right now. And so this morning, we're coming to you from our historic, beautiful sanctuary at Broad Street United Methodist Church. It's a beautiful place to worship, no matter whether it's contemporary or traditional, it's, it's God's house, and we're just glad to be here this morning morning and we're glad you're here and so I wanted to uh, share with you a couple of announcements this morning first of all we have sent out an Easter survey we need your help in trying to plan our Easter Sunday worship services and so if you will look at your e-blast that comes out by email each week on Wednesdays it came out this week or on our website, you'll find a link to that survey. We really could use your input. So I hope you'll take some time this week. It's a short survey, but we really do need to know what you think. So we hope that you'll do that for us. This morning, we are going to be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion. It's a very special time in worship. And so we know that you're at home there. Many of you have, have done this with us for a while, but for those of you that haven't, we invite you right now to go find some, something in your house. Uh, it, if you've got bread and grape juice, that's great. If you've got crackers and water, that's fine. Milk and cookies, whatever it is, feel free to, to go find that and have that ready so that you can participate with us in that holy meal, no matter what you have. It will be blessed, and we will be unified together at the table. And so this morning, as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we are so grateful to be here with you. Lord, we know that you are here waiting for us, and you are with us wherever we are. That you came here with us from our bedroom to the living room, Maybe we're just still, still sitting there in the bed this morning on our computer, but Lord, you're there. And it's because of you that we are unified together today in worship. And Lord, we know it's about you. And so we're glad to be here to lift up your name and to praise you, Lord. So guide us and lead us throughout this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
open and shower you with glory and power. Darkness seems to hide its face. 
shall come with trumpet sound. No way I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne. Well, friends, it comes the time now in worship where we remember what God has done for us. I don't know about you, but I have been blessed in so many ways. And I've learned a long time ago that I can never outgive God. But God calls for us to be cheerful givers, not to feel compelled, but to do it out of the gratitude of our heart. And so at this moment in our worship, I invite you to consider what God's done for you and see how you can give back. Maybe, maybe you have a conversation with him this morning on how you might do that. And so I invite you now to go with me in prayer. Almighty God, we ask that you would receive these gifts and offerings, that you would use them, that they would make a difference in this world, Lord, that you would know that we give them out of the gratitude of our hearts, and that we, you would use them to to build your kingdom and to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Christ Two weeks ago, we began our Lenten sermon series called Heartbeat, as we make our journey with Jesus to the cross and ultimately to the empty tomb. Today, we're talking about the heartbeat of worship. So let's begin by going to God's Word. Now, as we're reading the Gospels, uh, I invite you this morning, wherever you are, to stand if you're able as we read God's Word. I'm going to, I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 13 through 22. I hope you'll follow along with me. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle and scattered the money changers' coins over the floor and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What? they exclaimed. It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days? But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, this was quite a scene. It was Passover, a high holy festival in the Jewish tradition, a time when thousands of Jews would, would make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Jerusalem would be bursting at the seams. The streets would be filled with, with these pilgrims making their way to the temple. And this was a familiar ritual for them. 
For those who came, they're, they're in obedience they came. It was something that they knew that, that they were supposed to do. God had told them to do it. And as they arrived at the temple, they would have recognized the familiar sights and sounds and smells, the din of people taking business and taking care of, of all that they had brought with them, making their exchanges, making their transactions with the merchants selling animals for sacrifice and, and the money changers trading temple shekels for their pagan coins bearing the image of Caesar at a price, I might add, all so that they could pay their temple tax. It was familiar and it was expected. It was Passover. But it's highly unlikely that on this particular day that anyone was expecting what they saw. People were running from the temple porches into this dirty courtyard. And behind them was this loud bleeding of lambs and, and they were scattering in every direction along with the cattle and, and they were racing to freedom. And if this wasn't enough to get their attention... Surely the sound of the wooden tables crashing to the ground, followed by the clanging of, of coins being strewn across those stone porches, surely that got their attention. And then they saw it. The figure of a man chasing people and animals, tossing tables filled with coins to the ground. This was a strong figure, a strong man carrying a whip made from cords, cracking it in the air above the animals. The man's eyes were bright with anger, but they had some sadness in them too. What in the world is going on? What is this man doing? What is wrong with him? For those who witnessed this event, it was, it was nothing but chaos and confusion. They didn't understand what was happening. They didn't understand what this was all about. Well, this morning, as we look at this story, there may be some confusion for us. Why was Jesus so mad? Why did he do what he did? What did all of this mean? We could focus on the obvious, that, and, and that would be easy. We could consider the animals being sold for sacrifice, for instance. You see, animal sacrifice was a necessary part of worship at that time. But we might expect that, that buying and selling of animals would be done somewhere else, out in the marketplace in Jerusalem, not there on the temple grounds. Was it con for convenience sake that this was being done? You see, this was the court of the Gentiles where they were doing this trading or was this the desire of the high priest, Caiaphas, maybe to have some control over what was happening? Or could allowing this to take place bring some monetary gain to him and to the other religious officials? Certainly the merchants were making money. Many believe that they were using deceptive practices and, and that they were escalating their prices, taking advantage of the poor people that had come to make their sacrifices. Maybe Jesus was angry because this was the only place in the temple that Gentiles were allowed to come to worship. Surely the noise from the business taking place would have been a distraction for anyone trying to use that space for its real purpose. Then there were those money changers again. A necessary practice. They had to pay their yearly temple tax. It was due from each Jewish man. However, the money changers charged a fee to make that exchange. And it is widely believed that those fees weren't small. These are all possible reasons that Jesus was so angry that day. But I think Jesus' anger, his wrath, went much deeper than that. This was his father's house. This was holy ground, meant for worship, not for profit. The heart of the matter here is the heartbeat of Jesus 
for worship. What Jesus saw when he arrived at the temple that day was a perversion of something sacred that twisted the purpose and practice of worship. It wasn't what worship was all about. And when we think about it, we think about it, it's, it, it's very easy for us to see that, that we often get this wrong ourselves. Our own ways uh, we find to, to twist the purpose and the practice of worship, molding it into what we want it to be, something that profits us. We have this idea of what worship means, what it should look like, and we forget why we are here in the first place. So this is the question this morning. Why are we here? Why are you here? Why did you take time this morning to get up out of the bed and go in your living room and turn on the TV? Or, or why did you wake up and stay there to, to watch on your computer, to take that time to worship? You could have slept in. Why are you here this morning? Well, I grew up going to church every single Sunday from the nursery to the youth room. Every Sunday, I was faithfully in my place to worship at First United Methodist Church of Lexington, North Carolina. But I don't think I ever fully understood what true worship was until much later in my life. You see, as a child, I went to church because my parents took me to church. It was what I was supposed to do. I was being obedient to my parents. And that wasn't a bad thing. It's never a bad thing when parents bring their children to church. And then as a youth, I added another layer of reason for going to worship. My friends would be there. My boyfriend would be there. All the people that I wanted to be around would be there, and I wanted to be with them. But then I became a young adult, and worship wasn't so important anymore because I didn't understand what worship was really all about. You see, my focus was on myself, my life, my success, what I wanted, what I liked. And quite honestly, I just didn't have time for worship. You see, I had it all wrong. I thought worship was about me and what I could get from it. Then one day, as it often happens, my life began to, to spin out of control Things weren't going the way that, that I wanted them to. And, and I was in this downward spiral. And I thank God to this day for parents who took me to church each Sunday. Because when I hit that low point in my life, my first thought was, I need to go back to church. And I did. Now, I still didn't have it right. Notice what I said. I said, I need to go back to church. It was still all about me and what I needed. But even though I had it wrong, my wrong ideas led me back to a place and a practice that would change my understanding of worship altogether. And subsequently, it would change my life. Sadly, the church universal, Big C Church, all of our churches have a long history of not getting this right. You see, worship isn't about the style of clothes we wear or the style of music that we sing or, or worship uh, is not about the room that we worship from. It's not about what the band plays or, or whether there's a great, beautiful choir. Worship is not about liturgy or the lack thereof. It's not about great preachers or creative dramas. Those are not essentials to, wor to worship. The truth is, these things re reflect our wants and our desires, what we like and don't like. They really have nothing to do with what God wants. But we know that worship is about God. It isn't about the dress or music or venue or style or, or the instruments or the symbols. In fact, I believe these are Satan's way of keeping our attention on the methods of worship 
and our minds off of God. But you know, we have to start somewhere. And like it was for me, it all started with obedience. Doing what I was supposed to do. Obedience to my parents who were being obedient to God. Which brings me to my first point this morning. We worship because that is what God has told us to do. It's about obedience, and our obedience pleases God. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. What this verse states very clearly is that we worship because it pleases God. When we understand this, it shapes everything else that we do with worship. You see, the purpose of worship is not to please you or to please me. It's to please God. If you go to worship expecting to get something out of it, you aren't really worshiping God. You're looking for what you can get for yourself And you may very well leave very disappointed and empty. In fact, it's not nearly as important that you get something out of worship as it is for God to get something out of worship. But here's the good news. When you give all that you are in your worship to all that God is, then you will get out of worship all that God has for you. You see, worship is about obedience. But you know, it's also about devotion. In both Matthew and Luke's Gospels, Jesus is questioned by a religious leader about the greatest commandment. And Jesus tells him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment commandment. And this is what it means to worship, to give all that you are in devotion to God. And what is devotion? Devotion is simply love and surrender. When we love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, with all that we are and all that we have, when we are loving God with everything, we are demonstrating our devotion to him. And in order to love God completely, it is necessary for us to to surrender to God all that we have and all that we are. Again, our hearts, our souls, our minds, our control, our hurts, our habits, our hang-ups, our brokenness, our possessions, the good, the bad, and the ugly, all of it given over to God. When we surrender all, It is no longer about what we want, but about pleasing God. Romans 12, 1 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. In the same way that we practice uh, this sacrifice, we see that it was also important in Jesus' time. It was an important part of worship in his day, and it is in our day too. But it is, is a sacrifice of self, as Jesus did for us. No longer do we need those animal blood sacrifices because Jesus has shed his blood alone. And now we are to sacrifice ourselves for him. Jesus did it for us. And you see, sacrifice represents complete surrender, just as he did. Once you put a sacrifice on the altar, you lose total control of it. So we worship by surrendering ourselves to God as a holy and living sacrifice. And the one thing that God does not have unless you give it to him, what he will not take unless you offer it to him, is your worship. 
think about this. What do you give a God who has everything? The only thing that you can give God is the one thing that God does not have unless you give it to him. That is your love and your surrender and your worship. The heartbeat of worship is the worship of the heart. The way you can know that you have truly experienced the love of God in your heart is is when you want to give him that love back by offering him your life and your sacrifice in worship. Friends, God doesn't want ritual. God doesn't want religion. God doesn't want rules. God doesn't want regulations. God wants relationship. He wants a relationship that's filled with love, a relationship where you see and sense his love for you, a relationship where he sees your love for him. That is why the only way to truly worship God is to demonstrate your devotion by surrendering your life to him. Well, when I moved to Tennessee back in 1994, I began worshiping at Central United Methodist Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. I went that first Sunday because it was what I was supposed to do. But in the process of of being obedient to God, something happened. I began to understand worship in a different way. I signed up to help start a contemporary worship service, something that I really had no interest in, but, but I was willing to help start it because it wasn't about me. It was about pleasing God and, and making a place for new people to know him and to worship him. I was asked to pray in the worship service. Many of you don't know this, but, but I was terrified to pray out loud in front of anyone. It was, it was not where I was. Of course, God's had a great sense of humor in my life because I pray in front of many people now. But I was asked to pray in worship. And even though I didn't want to, even though I was afraid of it, I did it because it wasn't about me. It was about pleasing God. And eventually it was there that I answered a call to vocational ministry not because I wanted to stand up in front of people and preach the gospel, but because I wanted to please God. In worshiping first out of simple obedience, God graciously took me to a place of complete devotion and surrender in my worship. This was the byproduct of taking me out of the equation It was then that I experienced that transformation through my relationship with God in Christ. And my worship was forever changed. So I ask you again, why are you here this morning worshiping with us? Are you here because someone made you come? Someone woke you up and made you get out of bed? Are you here because you're supposed to be here? Well, it's okay. That's okay. It's a start. That's how it happens. We start there, but, but when we move from simple worshiping, because that's what we're supposed to do, to worshiping out of love and, and desire to please God, and when we give him our lives in complete surrender, our worship will be transformed. And not only that, our very lives will be transformed. The way we look at life, the way we look at the world, all will be different because all that we do is then centered around our devotion to God. Our lives change when our goal in life is to please God in all that we do. And that, my friends, is the heartbeat of worship. So as we remember that day in the life and the ministry of Jesus... As we remember that Passover so long ago, as we remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us, let us prepare to share in his sacred meal. Let us come to his table in obedience and devotion, bringing all that we are and all that we have to him in worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
We are so grateful, so grateful to be in your presence. And Lord, we know that it's not about us, that it's about you. And so we ask that, that you would help us to move from that place of simply being here because we're supposed to be here and come to that place where we are here for you and you alone. Lord, lead us, guide us, and transform us into those people, those worshipers that you have called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now I invite you to gather your elements, whatever it is, as we prepare the table. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you, when you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people abandoned your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And on your holy mountain, he heard your still small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to us to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during 40 days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. 
through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite you to take your bread or crackers or whatever it is to lift them up to God and remember that this is the body of Christ broken for you. And now I invite you to lift up your cup to say thank you to God for this is the blood of Christ shed for you, for your sins and for the sins of many. Now I invite you to fellowship around the table, whether you're by yourself or whether you're with a group, I invite you to be in fellowship with Christ and with one another as you are with us. Amen. I will be yours, oh, 
got the answer yet? Why are you here? I pray that, that as you think about that question today and this week, that you would find that place of transformation, that you would understand that worship is not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. And I pray that you would give your full devotion and surrender to him. Go now in peace, and may the peace of Christ go with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week. Because you have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go where you will lead me, Lord. You have called me higher, you have called me deeper, Deeper and I'll go away.